Good evening everybody and welcome to the Suckler Beef Breeding Summit. We're here on farm in Slane and I'm joined by a panel of experts to discuss some suckler breeding. Before we have a chat together, let's get a look at Hubert's farm and meet our panelists individually. We're here on the farm of Hubert and Sheila uh, Nicholson in near Drumcondra County Mead. Hubert is a suckler farm. Are you running what? Hubert, about 80 we're, suckler cows? Yeah, we've got about 80 suckler cows here at the moment. We've just, um, we've just finished uh, disbanding the autumn calvers and we've gone completely spring now at this stage. Um, this is our first year with uh, the full spring mode and it's going quite handy at the moment. Just give us a description, you're typically kind of Charlie, probably a little bit off mainstream from a lot of suckler guys, you're probably more typical Charlie cemental background in your females, is there? Yeah, we like a big, uh, a reasonably framed sized cow, you know, just big enough to produce a, a good heavyweight carcass, you know, yeah. in the offspring. We cross uh, cemental and Charlie back and forth, um, along with it, just a few pure Charolais. How's Calvin going or what, what yeah, stage no, are you at at the minute? It's going well, yeah. I had a few sets of twins and uh, everything's running smoothly. The AI selection on the, the, the cows and the heifers has seemed to work well. We haven't had too many problems. Nice sized calves, everything's running smoothly at the moment. We're really quite happy, but just, there's another few to go yet, so we're counting our blessings at the moment. Then we use AI on um, our handiest cows to get in calf, two AI. So either a long time calved or you know, they're on a rising, nice rising plane of nutrition, they're looking well. So we might AI some of them. Mm -hmm. So we'd select out a group maybe of uh, 25 cows, along with another group of the, the heifers, and uh, we'd AI away on them. What do you do, we'd say, what kind of a system have you got to make it easy for yourself? We'd say you're running cows in and out every day there and so, getting them AI to facilities and, and to make it easy. Yeah, so they mentioned there, that, so we run the two groups, the heifers normally stay as in the group of the heifers. So they're tail painted, the cows are also tail painted. But the, the heifers we find, if they're well fed and they're on a rising plane of nutrition, they seem to demonstrate heat fairly well. We don't have a problem picking them up. Our technician comes in just once a day then, around the middle of the day, and we AI them. We have electric uh, fences along our paddocks and electric fence roadway. Mm -hmm. So they're easy enough to get in. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes they come in twos and threes. Sometimes if there's a big number of heifers bulling, They'll, they might all come in. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, the same with the cows. The cows are easy enough to get in as long as you bring their calf with them. Because mm -hmm. what happens is, you, you know, they could be bulling away, being distracted, bulling away, and they suddenly get to the entrance of the field and they realize they've left the calf behind and then they'd shoot back off. Mm -hmm. So we just make sure that when you're rounding them up to get two or three in, you just bring every, every cow with their calf mm -hmm. and then they just come on in handy enough. So you would have your paddock running out basically onto a kind of a roadway that kind of yeah. Everton funnels straight into the yard and makes it easy to run them in and out. Uh, the roadway goes up the middle of the farm and it's, uh, we just work off that really. And once we have them on the roadway, it's more or less plain sailing into the, into the handling system. You know, we wouldn't be just going for the easiest of easiest of calves. Mm -hmm. We're looking for a little bit of frame. These heifers, you know, they're well able to um, carry a, a calf, a reasonable size calf, not don't get carried away now. Mm. And then one thing we'd be slightly interested in also is the myostatin status of the cows, of the bull, sorry, because we would have had a stock bull here at, um, going back who would have left a lot of cows on the farm, who would have had the Q gene in them, mm -hmm. which has transferred into a lot of the cows. We're probably, at the moment, we're just using probably myostatin-free mm -hmm. um, straws at the moment. I suppose a good way of guaranteeing if, you, if you're not sure of the myostatin status, like it. It's very easy now with the knowledge of the myostatin to be able to select your mm. on your calvinies to know that you're selecting bulls and are not carrying that myostatin. Um, you say you're pushing your calvin a wee bit there. I know you're Charlie Cemental based, like you're farming full time here at the minute. Eh? I yeah, I am farming full time and we'd hope the, the cows are calving under cameras. So I would be available um, mm. 24 hours a day to mm -hmm. um, help a cow if he was having a bit of trouble. That allows you maybe to push maybe the boundaries a little bit more on Probably, I probably am pushing a little bit more than say someone who is part-time farming and relying on a cow to calve itself. For me now, the fact that I'm away so often, calving is a big priority for me. I'd say probably calving is docility be two of the biggest criteria of me selecting. Because I'm not there, I want to make sure that when I come home, I've got the full the package alive, instead yeah. of a mess, you know. I wouldn't go bananas now on the cows. Around 10% difficulty of calving would be, for the Charolais, would be probably what we're looking at, you know. 
Yeah, just when you're on your bull selection, we'll say you might give us an idea of what kind of bulls you are picking and what you're selecting. We know that you're probably running basically two herds here at the moment. You've got a pedigree Charlie herd. Right, so on the, on the commercials, we have used, uh, this year we've got a Ludwig calf and we've got a few uh, Lapon calves. Mm. Um, and then on the heifers, um, commercial heifers, we're using uh, Gucci, Erp, a Frosty King, Mm. and AHC on some of the stronger heifers. You'd be pushing it even with the cemental, I suppose, on the top of that, but you're, you, you yeah, have no the, problem the Yeah, the heifers are mainly uh, three-year-old, the calving down at three years old. With regards to keeping it simple and keeping it really easy, tips-wise, if you were talking farmers with regards to managing and handling AI, what would your advice be? Have a reasonable group of cattle, uh, size-wise. Mm -hmm. if, if you could manage, if you could put uh, 30 cows or heifers, it doesn't matter. In together. It's quite difficult if there's a very small number left to find them bullying. But the tail painting is a huge advantage because mm -hmm. sometimes you know you could AI a cow without seeing a bull but the tail paint the, the is gone mm -hmm. you know and you, uh, you take a chance and you'd be surprised you know they hold you know so th that has worked. Synchronization have you? We have tried synchronization in the past um, with the heifers uh, and it worked well um, but I, I've just found the, the group of cattle we have at the moment, the tail paint is enough. We seem, we seem to manage to get them all served. I find for me at home now that synchronisation is a great aid because again, I'm trying to get, before we get busy in the spring with the AI, I'm trying to get my cows kind of tidied up. So I do tend to push synchronisation on batches of 20 or 30 and then they're done once they've gone off. Works really well, I find it really easy to manage. You're getting, you know, probably, probably hit two groups of 15 and I get a lot of cows AI'd very quick and then tidy up with the staff board, you know, for, as a part-time farmer or farm, but for me it works very well. You know, it is, yeah, it is something that we might look at in the future possibly, you know, to uh, make life a little bit easier for ourselves rather than dragging cows and heifers in and out. Have you any help around the farm or who, who, who's, who'd be your tipping, who'd be your right-hand woman or your, would there be anybody <laughs> else involved on? Yeah, no, uh, yeah, my wife uh, Sheila is very, very interested in the farming. She loves, absolutely loves the cattle. Uh, we introduced Sheila here on my house. She seems to be a real <laughs> farming lady there, that uh, uh, really enjoying the... She, uh, she watches the cameras from work and tells me when the cows are calving. <laughs> you there you go, right-hand woman. <laughs>Hi folks, so I'm currently joined here by our beef program manager here in NCBC, Rose Goulding. From your experience buying future AI sires, Rose, what, what sort of traits would you be selecting for? What kind of, what kind of market is out there? I suppose in selecting traits, it, it's all about profitability. Okay, so every single trait we look at, we're all thinking about profitability. So I suppose in selecting sires, what I'm thinking about when I'm selecting sires, it's, al it's always about what purpose is this animal going to fulfil? Is this a bull for maiden heifers? Is this a bull that will produce replacements? Or is this going to be a very, very good terminal bull? And um, more often than not, we're actually looking for that complete bull that will do all of those things for us. So um, it's about um, selecting according to function and selecting according to profitability. And the ideal animal really is the, is the complete animal um, that's relatively easy calving, good on replacement, good on terminal. And they're the animals that have been proven to be profitable. And have you found... Has the market changed? Have farmers bought into this, um, the, the Eurostar indexes, and are they using them now as a way to increase profit on their farm? Sure, I think things have changed over the last 10 years. Things have changed in the industry as well. Um, we have a um, very reliable index now. Um, very high percentage of beef animals in Ireland are genotyped. Um, we have the most genotyped beef animals in the world. And I think schemes like the, the BDGP and, and the BEAM have helped uh, farmers think a little bit differently about things. So um, with the beam, for example, when farmers started to weigh their cows and, and weigh their calves or weigh their weanlings, something they mightn't have done before, um, but it made them think about, you know, if they have a cow that's um, 850 kilos and um, she, we she weans a weanling of, you know, 270, and they might have other cows on the farm that are 600 kilos um, that weigh he heavy weanlings. So it really, um, I think it, the, the whole uh, schemes have helped people think differently about their farming. And the biggest difference I would say I would have seen over the last 10 years is a greater focus on uh, eliminating difficult calving. Not necessarily going extremely easy, but eliminating the difficult calving. Um, 
because um, a re there's a realisation there now that difficult calving costs a lot of money. You know, there's a risk of losing the calf, there's a risk of losing the cow. It has a big impact on the cow's uh, future uh, fertility from the point of view of going back in calf. Um, so that's the one big thing I've seen is eliminating difficult calving. And also herd owners are looking at the, um, the overall output from their herd. You know, for example, if they have 20 cows, they're looking at the number of weanlings they have to take to the mart, um, or if they're finishing the kilos of beef. So it's about the overall output. If you look at the overall output, how do you achieve that? It's about getting more live calves on the ground, making sure that uh, they have a very, very good weight gain, and making sure that the cows are working. So um, if you have a heavy cow, she's costing you more money on the farm. So guys are asking themselves, is, is she worth it? Have I a lighter cow that will actually give me more kilos to sell? Really positive changes. And, and uh, farmers thinking more about um, the overall outcome and the profitability as opposed to one individual exceptional animal. A lot of farmers would kind of say that you can't have a really top quality calf without needing the jack or that. Have we progressed genetically enough so that we can achieve easy calving while also bringing our carcass confirmation and our carcass weight with us? Oh, absolutely. Um, I think that's the biggest thing um, we have achieved with the NCBC breeding program over the last 10 years. So if you take a bull like Lapan, for example, he's only 4% calving difficulty. He's plus 40 kilos in carcass. Six or seven years ago, I, I actually didn't believe that that was even possible. But now we know it's possible. And we saw it also with bulls like uh, Fiston, bulls like uh, Cavill and Sfinian. So now with our younger bulls coming through, we're really focusing on easy calving bloodlines with big massive growth rate afterwards. And that's why we have a great advantage in AI because we select a number of bulls every year and then we go and test those bulls. And we put all our bulls in NCBC through Gene Island. So then we have our results out on the other side. And it's by testing more bulls that we can really find those, their diamonds, those bulls that can give us small calves at birth that have fantastic growth rate afterwards. So it is achievable, it's achievable through genetics. We can only achieve it if we have good data recording. Good recording of uh, calving difficulty, um, recording of birth weights, especially on pedigree farms, recording of weights. Um, and I think the beam has helped us see the benefit of recording weights on the farm. Just going back to that point of easy calving and of kind of our available bulls, um, what would you say to a farmer that was maybe considering going buying a stock bull and letting them to a, letting them to a group of beef heifers? Is that a risk or what does AI provide us um, in maybe preventing that uh, them problems coming down the line? Sure, I suppose the biggest advantage of AI for a suckler farmer is um, you, you can eliminate the nasty surprises because um, we have huge data on our proven AI bulls. Um, and especially if you take a lot of suckler farmers, um, most of them are part-time. So that's, th th that's point number one. Point number two, with AI you have a fantastic choice. So you can use, you can select bulls for your maiden heifers for extreme easy calving. You can select um, a different profile of bulls for your cows, depending on their parity. You can also select bulls for, uh, to breed replacements or bulls for really, really high terminal. So it's very hard for one stock bull to do all of that job. And the other big advantage of AI is um, the fertility of the semen. You have actually a better chance of getting more cows and calf at the end of the season because AI will not let you down. Well, a stock bull can let you down. And if a stock bull lets you down, you can lose months um, in your breeding season. And that's really catastrophic from a profitability point of view. Exactly. With that in mind, you have, you have much more scope to improve your herd genetically through the use of AI with your high milk bulls, your, you can use your easy calving bulls and your heifer. And what, what sires do you think we have um, suitable for beef heifers at the minute? Before we talk about bulls, we always have to look at the females that they're going on. So if you're talking about females that you're calving at two, um, I would go exceptionally easy calving at those and I would go for our proven bulls that are less, less than 6% calving difficulty. So just to give you a few bulls, if you take some of our Angus's there, um, we've Matteo, exceptionally easy bull and suckler heifers. Um, Natan Roy, Solaire bull. Um, he's a bull I would very comfortably use on heifers calving at two. Our Aubrac, uh, Tullamore Magnificent. So they're the sort of bulls I would use in the heifers calving at two. On your stronger heifers then, um, you can move on to your limousine, uh, Craig Park Marcus. Castleview Gazelle and uh, Moon Daragnell. 
and then on the on, on the cemental and again sticking with stronger heifers um bulls like uh lister Gris gucci and 50 cent as well so we have a massive choice for for maidens but also have a think about what type of maiden you have and what age you want to calf her down at and what would you say rose to say if you were a farmer and he predominant he's predominantly used um a charlie stock bull or a high terminal index bull over the last few years and now his females are coming on and they are lacking both milk and fertility what high milk bulls do we have that can improve that improve that index it's, it's a bit of a difficult ask to be honest if you really are very very short of milk and you want a big big jump in milk um the best way to keep milk in a suckler herd is to try and keep it with every generation and 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 don't lose sight of it and keep keep going with a good level of milk that's that's the best way of working but if you are in a situation that you're really really poor in milk and you want to breed your own replacements you have to select really high milk bulls so the first thing I would say is don't just look at the replacement index look at the milk index okay that's the first thing a lot of us make that mistake um, and when you're looking at the milk index you would need to select bulls um, at least plus four kilos but if you if you really wanted a lot of milk um, you would have to go higher plus eight plus ten kilos but we have a couple of limousines there in the catalogue that are plus four kilos cross liam is a great example of a bull that's high in milk he's plus four kilos and then if you look at some of the simmental bulls um, they're plus eight and plus ten kilos and more um, so my advice would be look at the kilos of milk go for a minimum of four kilos and then the higher the better, especially if you're really, really short. Okay, and what um, cemental bulls would you recommend to do that job that we that are in currently in Progressive Genetics or Munster Bovine? Oh, Curry Narp, I absolutely love. He's a bull that's uh, he's a 100% proven bull. He's got 99% beside all his traits down along his page. So um, we know exactly what he's going to do. And he's such a well-balanced, complete bull, good in calving super on uh, super to breed replacements and very good terminal bull as well so he's just a very hard bull to pass because he takes all the boxes after that we've listed Gri Gucci um, who's an easy calving sire he can be used on strong maidens um, good on milk really nice quality as well and he's also um, a modern bull because he's quite early maturing and that's one thing we we'll need to be looking at more and more now in sucklers is earlier maturing cattle and cattle that um, will reach uh, slaughter earlier. So age of slaughter is one of the big things. We have a new bull, Leehard Lynx. He, he's a young bull, um, but he's a really lovely quality bull. Nice, easy calving pedigree. So he's another bull I would, um, I, I would consider. But if you want to go proven, um, we have a massive choice there. There's Arp, there's 50 Cent, there's Gucci, Ruby Gin, here's Johnny's, another bull actually just come up with really high index. So there's actually a massive choice. So you have another farmer, he's just after bull, or, uh, serving his cows uh, for breeding his replacements and he wants to go back with a terminal bull. What do um, Munster or Bovine or Progressive Genetics have to offer him to improve that carcass weight, carcass conformation within his herd? Okay, so I suppose starting with the, the, the limousines, we have Noob there who's a bull that's uh, very good on carcass weight and really exceptional in carcass conformation. So he's one bull that can really, really do that job. Um, there's also Tom's Choice Imperial a bull we've had around for quite a long time, but a bull that's really hitting those uh, targets and carcass weight and carcass conformation as well. And then our younger bulls, um, our pole bulls, or mallet, um, he's starting to be the next bull, the next generation that will give you that carcass weight. Moving on to Charlie, Lapan is just exceptional. He's very easy calving and he's plus 40 kilos in carcass. Um, so he would be, you know, um, a go-to bull, uh, absolutely. Also, I would consider some of the younger bulls like Orby and Omega. Um, calves are hitting the ground, massive farmer satisfaction, so really, really good quality. Especially Omega, lot of shape, very, very good weight gain. Um, and then we have a younger Feast and Sun coming along as well, uh, Cluna Drone Ricky. Um, so, you know, should be a very, very interesting bull. So for farmers that are looking for that kind of, we see at the minute in the marts and at sales throughout the country, that roan and shape that farmers are looking for, what sort of bulls do we have to give that kind of colour in, in, within their herd? It's quite difficult to guarantee colour because colour is, um, colour genetics is quite complicated. So from a colour point of view, if you re it's very hard to guarantee roan. Genetically, all limousines have two copies of the, of the red gene. So all limousines are going to bring the same thing to the table from a colour point of view. 
Um, so if you're talking about uh, limousine and roan, it has to come from the female side. After that, you're talking about short horns, if you really want roan, um, or um, um, a new red, that red blue. Um, if you put them in red cattle, you, you will get red and uh, you'll get a lot of very good carcass confirmation from him. He's, he's probably the best choice if you want colour and you want high carcass confirmation. Another Belgian blue bull that's doing a fantastic job for us is PPS, Patissier. Um, he's a white bull, but he's carrying the red factor. So he's a bull put, it, put on red cows, you'll probably get 50% red or red and white from him. Um, but I would really focus on quality over colour every day of the week. You can always sell quality. Um, the colour uh, is a bonus, but it's also a bit of a niche market. So okay. I would really aim for quality over colour any day of the week. I know you probably don't like uh, giving away secrets, but is there anything new that might be coming up this spring? There is. There is. Um, we have a lot of new sires um, entering the stud right now um, uh, that I'm very excited about. A new Charlie Bull Grangewood Royal Oak. Uh, a Gold Star Echo Sun from an infield Picasso Dam. An exceptional bull, weight, shape, quality. Um, so he's a bull I think that will, will uh, ultimately become one of our weaning specialists. We have another Charlie Bull who's a very interesting pedigree. He is Carbon Rory. He is the son of Blaylac Digger from a Clyde dip Diplomat Cow. Big, long, very muscly, very, very good bull. A bull that will give a lot of weight and a lot of shape. On the limousine side, um, we have a young bull called Celtic Rembrandt, a son of a Dacia from um, a four-man cow who's an exceptional breeder. And he's one of those bulls I expect to be a, a very complete bull. Um, average calving, good on replacement, good on terminal, but we need to test them to see. And um, we have another young limousine entering the stud, uh, Rutland Rambo. Um, he is a Tom's Choice Iceberg from a Queensland Altea Dam. Very easy calving pedigree, very good weight gain, very good quality, very good temperament. We, we always have new bulls entering the stud every year because we always select so many sires every year and, uh, and we test those sires and we put them all through Jean Island. And we don't fall in love with them. You know, we, we, they're exceptional bulls when we select them, but we put them through the testing process and we really fall in love with them when they're proven then and they're, you know what I mean, they're really profitable, useful bulls. So it's then we fall in love with them. Absolutely. Um, but it's important to test them. Absolutely. And that's the benefit that AI gives you. Absolutely. Uh, thanks very much, Rose, for taking the time out to um, chat uh, this evening. Um, I'm sure it's very informative for, every, for everyone listening. If you have any other queries, you can contact your local sales advisor or you can contact the Enfield or Munster Bovine offices um, for semen inquiries. Dennis, uh, we're, we're going to talk a little bit about the AI and sucklers. And there's some fear out there, I think, for people using AI. It's, it's awkward. We might have a smaller herd. It can be working off farm or working part time, and we don't have time to heat stick and so on. Mm -hmm. Some advantages of using AI, first of all, in our suckler or beef suckler cows. Oh, I suppose the huge advantage is, Martin, is the selection of sires. So you have access to the, the to the top sires, not only in the country but probably in the world. You know, so whatever breed you want and whatever job you want them to do, whether it is a really easy calving, guaranteed easy calving for heifers to breed, you know, high quality replacements with milk and fertility to be future dams in your herd, or whether it is terminal weanling production, you know, or, or fattening or whatever. So that, that selection of high genetic merit animals and the guaranteed calving ease is a, is a huge thing for me. Yeah, and I think that guaranteed calving ease is always in our mind. And the two of us are vets talking about this. Yeah. The one thing in our mind is pulling out these very, very big, big beef calves. And, yeah. and, that, and that as a knock-on effect really slows down how those cows go back in calf. It is a huge knock-on effect on their fertility. Yeah. If they have a difficult calving, they're going to be, it's going to knock a lot out of them. They're going to be slow coming back cycling, and particularly at heifers. And there's a huge advantage to actually calving in your heifers at, at two years. So if you can grow them well, get them up to target weight, and then use the correct... Uh, AI sire them, you know, so the likes of maybe Nocturne Rye, really, really easy calving. They have an easy calving, they'll get up and running, get going with their calf, 
and they'll have a great chance of going back in calf again. Because it seems a lot of things with, with suckler cow, with, with suckler cow management, breeding, and that profitability is we are calving our heifers a little old. We are not getting the numbers of calves per cow that we should get in our lifetime. So there's a real drive here to get this breeding better. Is that is that fair enough? There is. Sure. Look, that's. I think that is really where you can, where we can gain efficiency. Is yeah. is to calve our heifers at two years. There's no reason why we can't do it and also to pull back the calving interval, so to try and get a cow, a calf out of each cow every year. And I suppose the challenge there is the, the, the time from calving to getting them back in calf is actually quite short. So we've only 70 or 80 days to get them back in calf so that they'll calve within 365 days. So there's a lot of things we need to get right um, management wise to try and achieve that. So, so a key thing, I did, and, and I'm thinking back here straight away into some Michael Diskin's work at the time was, that body score of that cow calving down and her body score, maintaining her body score before you put her back in calf, yeah, so how tis, significant? It is absolutely critical in sucklers yeah. that, they're, that they're in decent body condition score at calving. And I suppose a rule I use, you don't want them fat because it's going to affect their, their calving ability, but certainly you don't want them thin because they're going to be much slower to come back cycling after calving. So to try and have them you know, above two and a half in, in, in decent body condition score at calving, and there's a huge knock-on knock on benefit to that then as regards coming back cycling and going back in calf quickly. Okay, so, so we want that fit but not fat cow. I know it's, it's a bit of a classic statement, because yeah, yeah. in my experience of it, we often overfeed. That mm -hmm. suckler cow is well overfed by the time she's calving. Yeah. And then the risk is that we're, she's not on a good plane of nutrition. Exactly, they can be, I suppose they can be dry for, depending on when they were weaned, sure. they can have quite a long winter dry, uh, and there's a huge scope there to put too much condition in them. Equally, I suppose if they're on very poor soilage, they can be, mm. they can be under conditioned or if they're, if they're not weaned that long, if the, if the calf is with them a long time, they can be under conditioned and that will affect their, their future fertility the following year. Okay, so again, we're back into this piece of heat detecting, get, getting our AI done right. I think a lot of our suckler farmers are, are working elsewhere and so on. So uh, just maybe a couple of guys around heat detecting and getting cows on heat. So another thing we have to be mindful of in sucklers is, is the maternal bond, so that the calf is suckling and that has a negative impact on, on their ability to come back cycling. So when the calves are 30 days old, it's worth, if it's possible, to try and break that bond. So try and move to twice a day suckling if you can. So if the calves are in a creep, you know, there's maybe a chance to leave the cows out to grass maybe during the day or something. Equally in the autumn, maybe leave the calves out and keep the cows inside, but to try and break that bond will really, you know, will bring, bring them bullying quicker. And, and do you need that visual break? You really need to get that separation between um, ideally, yeah. yeah, but like even having a creep area in another in another shed is going to be a help. But yes. if you can really break it and keep the calf away for you know for twelve hours, uh, so twice a day suckling, that really they do okay. they do come in. Uh, and I'm sure some guys have just rolled their eyes to heaven on that one. But yeah, actually, it's yeah. quite it is practical. It yeah. is it is very doable. Yeah, yeah. When you see people doing it and the simple you know the yeah. simple systems they have to do it, it is it is possible to do it. So like in the autumn, there you know having a door on the, on the creep and the calves head off out and, and nibble away a bit of grass, you know, it's great for their health, they're getting a bit of grass into their diet, and it's also breaking the bond. And in your experience, uh, Dennis, how, how quick are those cows then starting to come to you when you've established that, the, those breaks? Yeah, it is, it is amazing actually, they'll actually start, you know, you'll, you'll visibly notice the, the heat start to go up, you know, if you can break that bond, they'll come in cycling quicker. And I suppose the next challenge then, Martin, is, is heat detection and actually detecting these cows. So really you need to put on some kind of heat detection aids you know, the obvious one in sucklers, in suckler cows, they're big heavy animals, is tail paint. They're often a bit hairy, so there's an advantage there, I think, to get you clippers, clipping the tail head, mm -hmm. putting on a nice strip of paint. A lot of people are part-time, they're not going to be around, but at least if you come back in the evening, then you can have a quick look around and see who's, who's missing the tail paint, um, and they're the ones then for, um, for AI. For AI, okay, excellent. So, okay, we're heat detecting. Another, another um, I, I suppose, uh, uh, part of our armory here is synchronization with these cows. Explain maybe a little bit, again, people will be afraid of synchronization, it's a complication, how can we do this? Is it simple to do this with suckler cows? It is, I suppose, the modern program that's there now for suckler cows, it's a 10 day program. It ends in fixed time AI, so that's, that's, that's a huge advantage. So there is no heat detection. So at the end of the 10 days, it's fixed time AI, you have your te technician booked, um, so he's going to be in the yard and all the cows are AI'd on the one day. That is really, if I'm working off farm, if I'm doing this part time, if I'm doing this at weekends and so on, I have a real opportunity here to book in that AI, that AI to can plan all this. Yeah, is that oh, fair absolutely. To say? Yeah. So I suppose start at the end, book your AI technician, book, yep. uh, make sure the bulls that you want are in his pot. Uh, next person to talk to is your vet to, to start off the program. So that 10 day program, it involves putting in a prid or a cedar at the start and an injection of GNRH. 
on day seven then, at the same time that you're going to be AIing, the cedar is pulled, the cedar or the prid is pulled, they get a shot of prostaglandin, mm. they get a shot of a drug called uh, ECG or, or PMSG, mm. and then three days later, it's fixed time AI, and they get another shot of GNRH. So we have three events here. Three events, so that program is specifically designed for sucklers to try and minimize that, because these animals aren't going to be coming into the crush um, or coming into the yard, so the program is designed to minimize the handlings. So three handlings and all your animals are inseminated. Okay, and not crazy expensive. I'm not looking for an exact cost or anything, but no. it's, it's not crazy expensive. Yeah, not, not crazy expensive, yeah. We go from there, for, from, from that synchronization piece, some people, they're fierce straight away is, oh, if I do that, all these cows are going to calve together. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to have a nightmare. It's going to create a lot of work for me. I is that the case or is there a spread, Dennis? Yeah, no, I, I do it at home and the sucklers at home, both in the heifers and the cows, and they don't all calve to one day. You know, there's a spread. It could be two weeks um, mm. from start to finish. Um, you know, so there's a, there's, a, there's a spread there in, in, when they calve. So don't be afraid of all the animals calving together anyway. That's, that's not something to be afraid okay. of. Just, just recapping our advantages again, our advantages in doing AI for, uh, for, for these suckers. Oh, I suppose, number one, you'll tighten up your calving. So it's going to bring cows that aren't bulling, it's going to bring them bulling, you know. Okay. So you're going to tighten up your calving. They're all going to be submitted and AI'd on the, on, on the one day. There's a huge advantage then that you can actually pick up the repeat. So put on your, your heat detection aids, uh, 18 to 24 days, a very small window. Um, so you should have no bother picking up the heats. And it's the choice of bulls then, you know, and one of the huge, the biggest things in sucklers in my experience is if they can have an easy calving, the workload for yourself is easier, the management is easier, the calf gets up and sucks if, if there's an easy calving. As regards fertility, they're going to come back bulling, they're going to go back and calf and the whole system is going to be easier and more profitable. Conception rates okay after sinks? I suppose, look, you're expecting 60 plus in the Very cows. Mm -hmm. um, and heifers, again, like there's a real opportunity there to use synchronization in heifers. It's a shorter program. It'll be on our website or whatever anyway, and your vet will know about it. And it, there's a real opportunity there to use AI in your heifers and use easy calving bulls with high reliability. So you're almost guaranteeing them an easy calving, which gives them a great chance to, to stay in the herd. Thank you, Dennis. Go on, Mark. Tell us a little bit about how you manage your breeding season. Okay, Rose, so we want to calve fairly tight from the last week of February um, for about eight weeks. So that's, that suits us, it suits our grass supply and it suits the way our farm is so we're fragmented. So I, I'll start breeding middle of May and what I'll do is I'll have cows out at grass. You know, everything is calved by then and our focus is very much on high plane nutrition. Um, any cows that maybe are carrying twins or even first calvers might be getting a small bit of preferential treatment, nothing major. But I'll be aiming to breed about eight cows through a synchronization protocol on maybe the 15th of May, and that kicks off my breeding season, so it helps me to get a big bust of cows at the start of calving. So I will move in with uh, cedar 10 days out from that day, um, cedar in, receptol, cedar out day seven, estimate, and then breed plus receptol on day 10, and that's me started and then it will be over to um, the moo call detection collars for the rest of the cows. So we'll do natural heat detection but artificial heat detection if you like because they'll pick it up because we all work off farm. Uh, we'll be AIing in the morning every morning before we go to work and we can't really AI during the day but once a day AI does work for us and then as I said we'll be able to get everything wrapped up within eight weeks and generally we have. I would say we moved to the moo call heat detection about four years ago and since then as well as a massive reduction in labour our conception has gone up so it's a, a two-pronged reward if you like. My bulls will be picked and I nearly have my bulls picked during calving season already um, and we do it a small bit differently so calving as, as it should be with everyone calving difficulty is number one and then what we'll do is I focus on the cow I focus on getting a female because we're very conscious of breeding good cows. I think some people can take the eye off the ball. They just focus on the bull. It's like having a football team and only training the forwards and not caring about defense. So your cow is half your genetics, essentially. So we'll try and breed a good cow. So I'll pick maybe 10, 11 bulls to use across my cows. And I'll try and get good all-rounder bulls. Positive milk, very important. High carcass weight's very important because I am a finisher. Like we are finishing, pushing the thing. Then whatever the cow needs in terms of things that will complement her own traits. What, like, what can I improve on? And then obviously the carcass weight figure means if we get a male, we're still not too bad off. So 
every cow will have a bull assigned to her. If there's a cow for whatever reason I don't want to breed from, they'll get terminal, generally Charlie, the likes of your Lapons or your Fistons. And then any, any repeats, I'll probably go terminal on those as well. Um, heifers will always get Angus. And that last year that was Fergal, Maverick or RGZ. Just like the vigor of the Angus, the easy calving. And then I find if a heifer's a bit spooked sometimes, what's going on? Because we're calving at two. Um, the heifer, you'll have a, a relentless little bugger of an Angus calf who will just try his damnedest to suck and he'll generally get there. So, um, and that's our focus. In terms of other bulls I'll be, I'll be using, Smental is a favorite of mine. Um, we have a lot of Smental cows in the herd, herd now, but I'm always trying to introduce Smental genetics um, to any cow that doesn't have Smental genetics. So we, we focus on hybrid vigor big time, as I was saying. So Smentals, I'm looking at Gucci, I'm looking at Earp, and I'm looking at Frosty King this year. Um, Solaire, again, something we dabbled in a few years ago and it's worked really well for us and I've gone with Solaire every year since. I was a big fan of the likes of Highfield Odrin. Now it's Not Town Roy has taken the mantle up from him. Um, first calves in the ground from him the last few weeks, looking good. Limousine, Nell is a favourite of mine, good all rounder. So if I have a, a good Solaire across Charlie Cow, she's a perfect candidate for a limousine straw. Um, and I use a bit of shorthorn this year just to try and get that rony hef little heifer out of a re like you know we're good. Our cows are probably pushing R plus. You know they're good mm -hmm. quality cows. We're averaging about 740 kilos on all of our breeding females, so they're big. So I was got, trying to get a shorthorn heifer to maybe get a little rony heifer to sell live to someone for big money. But unfortunately, I've got bulls. But I must say, I think it was Firefox was the bull. Phenomenal little calves, blocks of calves, really really stylish. So I'm happy enough. And I, that's what we did last year. And I probably won't do too much different next year. I might have a look and see is there any new limousines on stream. Um, I like to have more than one option. And Solaire as well. We used pretty much all Not Town Royal last year, so we'll have a look at what other Solaires there are. So you very much look at complementing the bull to suit your cow. Yeah. And, and also then specifically looking, looking at the individual traits you're actually looking for. Yeah, exactly. So what, what kind of, uh, give me a few figures here. So if you want to improve milk, what's your cutoff point from a kilo's point of view in milk? What are you mm. looking at? I would like, and I think Nell has it, at and over like four, four kilos, positive milk, putting milk into it. Most mm -hmm. of my cows are milky to be fair because um, we've been doing this since I was a tot. My father's been thinking the very same about it. We've probably focused more in on traits like milk, traits like carcass weight, but he has he had been using the genetics long ago. Carcass weight wise, then I'm at an over 20, at minimum 20, because look, we're producing kilos of beef. Sure. It's hugely important for us. And our weaning weights are good. So creep free, we don't creep feed before we would weigh the calves at weaning. Um, bulls doing about 1.32. That's warts and all, which I'm very happy with. Heifers doing about 1.27 last year, I think it was. So that's all milk, like there's mm. no supplementary feed for calves there. So it just shows you what you can do if you focus on improving milk, which is probably something going back a decade that wasn't, you know, I was sure. off the ball a small bit in Sutton, so. Sure, sure. And tell me a little bit about your, um, when you're breeding replacements, what are you thinking about? What's, what's your ideal suckler cow? What does she actually do for you? What do you think about when you're thinking about your ideal suckler cow? That's a great question. Probably three things. Uh, she behaves herself. I remember a guy telling me once he was looking for the invisible cow, quiet cow that doesn't cause any issues for him, both from a, obviously a, 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 an aggression point of view, but also, you know, that, that can come in under the mantle of good feet, good udder as well. Basically a cow that you don't have to worry about. Mm -hmm. Produces a heavy calf, so milk, and then goes back in calf, so the 365 days. If you can do those three things, like there's not much else a suckler cow really, you know, if you get into the nitty gritty, you want to feed a fishing cow that you can, you know, a spring calving cow shouldn't be um, getting a, a top quality menu of stuff for the winter. She should be able to survive when she's weaned on the bare minimum because that's money in your pocket. So a good feed a fishing cow. But I think if you can do those three things, you're not going to be too far wrong with your suckler cow. Sure, no, no, I agree, I agree. And tell me then about your heifers. You, you, you spoke about putting very easy calving bulls on your maidens. At what age do you calve down your females for the first time? Yeah, so as I said, we're eight weeks religiously. That's when we can calve. That's when we can schedule calving in around our times. We all work off farm. So it has to be two years or it has to be three years. And we're not going to be looking at animals for three years on the farm before we get something from them. So we've been calving at two years for well over a decade. It works well for us. Look, it starts from when that heifer is a suck calf itself. If you can get that weight gain 
1.1, 1.2 kilos in the first season, get them through a good first winter and get them back out to grass early ahead of breeding season, to me, you have a, you have a lot of the job done there. Heifer fertility, a lot of it is about growth targets. That's why we always talk about the 60% weight at breeding and that's crucial. That's nothing to do with age, that's to do with her being heavy enough so that her, her reproductive system essentially switches on. Um, then in second winter ahead of calving, we would segregate the heifers in their own kind of half pen and feed them top quality silage. Um, keep an eye on them, make sure they're, you know, keep an eye on condition. But they don't, to be fair, we don't do anything like too drastic, you know, we, don't, we won't be putting meal into those heifers. I feel like if we're putting meal into them, we had taken the eye off the ball beforehand, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, and then around calving time, we'd just be very conscious of, you know, uh, uh, we'd probably be a, s a small bit more preferential to them in terms of maybe feeding meal for a few weeks after calving, but again, nothing major because feeding meal to a, a calved suckler cow or even a heifer is not, you know, you want to keep your meal for your growing cattle mm. and your finishing cattle. But to me, easy calving sire, if you can get a heifer growing well and using easy calving sire, and then ideally second winter looking after them, so segregating them away from the rest of the cows who are probably getting less good quality silage, it's half, half the battle. It's worked well for us. Look, I, I don't find us culling a lot of heifers. The, the animals I'm culling now are cows that are a bit impotent, yeah, a bit aggressive, um, bad feet, yeah. bad udders. That's what I'm culling. I don't want to be culling heifers because I, ca I didn't manage them correctly and calved them down too light and they didn't go back and calf. So thankfully, touch wood, it's not something we've had to do in the last few years. Okay, great, yeah, I agree. It's, so calving heifers at two is all about um, being consistent and keeping them going all the time. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's that plane of growth, the plane of nutrition, um, getting to grass early in, 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 you know, as yearlings, um, getting lots of weight on prior to weaning. And look, again, that goes back to having milky cows as well. You know, Absolutely. If, if, you put, if you get the cow to put half the weight on the heifer, um, through milk, that's less feed you have to give them in the winter and subsequently in, when they're weaned and at grass the next season. So, yeah, I, to be honest, I, could, I couldn't see us not calving at two because we, where would they go on, on our farm? You know, it would just completely scupper our, our structure for grazing, our structure for winter housing. We'd have to be going in with extra meal. I know it's not, it's some people don't believe in it, but like we're very commercial minded um, and yeah, we just have to. Sure, sure. With no choice. So you speak there about managing the performance, you know, the weights of your um, males to weaning, your females to weaning. Um, do you have a weighing scales at home? How often do you weigh your animals? And, so and what other metrics do you look at when you're, you know what I mean, when you're trying to figure out, am I, am I achieving my targets here? Yeah, weight is everything. So we would get the ICBF weighing technician in twice a year just because he's actually a guy that lives in the parish, so we can get him on short notice on a Saturday. Um, and I find it's, go it's good to have an extra set of hands at that time as well, because a shiny scale is coming into a yard. Sometimes calves can be dancing on it for a while, so it's good to have an extra set of hands in. And we do that twice. We do that weaning, just before weaning, maybe about 200 days of age. And then again at turnout, because at turnout, my bulls will be starting to ramp up in the finishing shed. So it gives me an idea of where the bulls are at. They'll be about 11, months old at that stage, they don't go back out for a second season. Um, and th that's crucial. And uh, you know, everything we'd be looking at those weights, studying them, going back to the cow, and that will inform us on our culling decisions. Um, like a few years ago, our culling decisions would have been, in for t you know, cows not back in calf would have been the main one. But now that we've got a handle on conception rates, heat detection, we can start to think about, okay, well, she doesn't behave herself at calf and she has to go. Even if she's rearing a phenomenal calf, you know, you don't want to be a number in a newspaper. No. <laughs> um, unfortunately, that, that does happen. So now we're very conscious of getting rid of, even cows that are awkward. You know, when you're 100% AI getting cows in and, and during the summer and going to work after, some cows don't walk in mm -hmm. and to the shed. So they're awkward. So they go. You know, it's about making a job as convenient as possible because as a part-time suckler farmer, time is your currency. Sure. Um, so being able to do that with culling decisions is great. and now we're starting to look at well that calf was doing 1.1 because as you say we're weighing the calf was doing 1.1 you know the rest of the group's doing 1.3 is that a calf now is that mother you know is the milk there or is there something else going on and it's just phenomenal like i know it's how many times it's been said if you don't measure you can't manage absolutely so it's, it's weights are big one like we sell weight we sell kilos of carcass weight so you have to weigh it's 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 futile measuring what you've produced the day you sell 
Um, do, you, do you look at other metrics like um, calves per cow per year, output from the farm, kilos of beef? Kilos per livestock unit is up quite high. I think we're in the top third, so I'm happy with that. We get that report on ICBF. Um, calves per cow per year is a, is a no-brainer. Like if they don't go back in calf, they're gone. You know what I mean? We, we can't. We used to keep a couple of passengers. Again, because we've, we've, got, we've upped our game on heat detection and, and conception, now we can afford to be rootless. You have to. Suckler cow costs you over a thousand euros a year to keep, so if she's not giving you something that year, that's, a, that's expensive. So even if she's your favourite cow with the lovely white spot or the bit of roan, she can't be really hanging around, not in the suckler game. Um, so yeah, definitely, like that's, that's, that's not even a metric, that's like binary. If she's not in calf, into the, in for a couple of months, or not, in a couple of months, in for a month on meal and she's gone. Super it's a nice great. bit of cash flow as well, to be fair. You're like, you'll always have a couple of cows after breeding that don't go in calf, so for whatever reason. Um, and it's a, it's a little boost in cash flow if you can slaughter them with your other animals too. Sure, great, Kieran. So just to sum up on your farm, um, you, you, you like to measure because if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Um, it's all about efficiency. But it's also about managing, managing your time well and using yeah. technology like synchronization, the moo call, um, just to help you plan your, your farming around when, you're, when, you're, when you can be at home. Yeah. And also then managing your cows because um, cows with bad odours, cows with bad temperament, cows with bad feet, they all take time. Yeah. Um, and that's really important for a part-time farmer. Time is really the, 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 the one thing you have very, very little of. Yeah. So it's about having those cows that um, having that invisible cow, I exactly, love that. Yeah. You know, and the, the best cow in the herd is the cow whose number you don't know because yeah. she does the job and you don't have to know her. She just tips away. Yeah. I would yeah. say it's kind of a weird one, but almost the beauty of uh, suckler farming is it's not farming, if you know what I mean. It's farming on your terms, not having to be called away to this. This cow has bad feet, unplanned things. It's farming on your terms. 40, 50% of suckler farmers in the country are part-time. They're, they're doing something else. So you need to be able to plan it in a way that it works for you, but also that you, like you enjoy it. You know, Absolutely. You're not printing money, suckler farming. And a lot of us are in it because we love breeding cattle. We love farming, we love the outdoors. So if you can marry a farm that works for you with you know, the enjoyment factor of it and make it convenient and fit your off-farm job in so you're not walking around with two bags under your eyes, you know, you're on to a winner. Happy days. Great. Thanks, Kieran. Thanks you're very welcome. much. We're here on the farm of Robert McGuinness in Slane County Mead. Robert is a suckler farmer. He's also an AI technician with progressive genetics. And in addition to that, he offers uh, his own scanning service. So Robert, tell us a bit about your suckler enterprise at home. I'm farming just out of Slane in County Mead, uh, farm alongside my mother and father. Uh, we've over 100 suckler cows, calving the cows in December and January, uh, taking a break for Christmas. We're taking most of our progeny through to finishing. Uh, but also sell in some stores and we also breed our own replacements. Okay, perfect. And um, to breed your cows, um, do you use AI or what's your breeding policy on the farm? I would say we're mostly AI at about 80-85%. We've got one stock bull which we rotate and we also use a, a teaser bulls to help heat detect. In fact, the teaser bulls take all the work out of heat detection. It's just a matter of turning up in the field and picking out the cows that has paint on them. Uh, we use a chin ball on the teaser uh, to simplify the job. And tell me about your synchronization program. How, uh, what program do you use? We use the 10 day program that's at the back of the AI catalog. I find it very handy for AI and batches of cows. It's a very organized way of getting your cows and calf and you can organize around the AI. Okay, so give us a, give me a bit of advice um, in in relation to to, to synchronization. Um, how soon after calving would you start? What's your advice as a as an AI technician to actually set up synchronization the best way? We would give at least uh, thirty five to forty days before starting the ten day program to get good results. You just need to cover the basics, having the cows in good body condition on a rising plane of nutrition. Then you should get good results. If you're going to use an AI tech technician to to serve your cows then just make sure you're well organized and that you've uh, told him well in advance of your plans and so that he can organize the bulls you, you want and book you in for that day. And do you use fixed time AI? It's, it's fixed time AI yeah and it still offers uh, plenty of flexibility uh, at the time of AI -ing. 
there's a big window of opportunity to, to get the job itself done. And from a management point of view, does that suit you as a, you know what I mean, as a busy man that has another job serving cows on the road and as a scanning cows? How do you find it, 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 the management of that right throughout the year? So uh, traditionally we used to calve our cows in February, March, but because uh, the AI has gotten busier, we've pulled the calving back to December and January. We synchronize our cows in two batches. We AI the first batch at the end of February, so they'll be calving early to mid-December. Then we stop and then we go again and start calving in early January. That's all to get the, the breeding season at a, on the home farm mostly wrapped up before going out on the road during the busy AI season. Okay, and from the point of view then of managing your calving and your, um, you know, your groups of calves on from there? It makes it extremely easy. Uh, you can uh, batch your cows according uh, as to our calving dates for vaccinating, and then you can really focus on them cows while they're calving. Instead of when you use a stock bull, you're more vigilant. Uh, looking at cows, cows that's nowhere near calving. So you know exactly what cows are going to calve and when within 10 days of calving. Uh, so from a management point of view, it's uh, very practical and uh, more organized and handier. So you, syn you synchronize a batch of cows on one day. So tell me a bit about the calving season then. Did they calve over what period of time normally? So last year we calved 25 cows between the 3rd of December and the 22nd of December. Uh, and they were all AI'd on the one day, so there wasn't a massive batch of ca cows calving on the one day. Uh, I'd say the most we ever had was four, four to five on any given day. Um, they were due on the 8th of December, but the carryover with, with the beef bull, the longer gestation, uh, the 12th, the 16th was probably the busiest days for calving. Um, but no, it wasn't hectic. And from a management point of view of getting beasts into calves too, you've got some cows that have too much milk and some cows that don't have as much. So when they're all calving at the same time, it's a lot easier to, to get adequate beasts into the calves without going to neighbours and tawing out beasts. Sure, so you can, you can almost manage everything better. And what's your advice to farmers from the point of view of having a lot of cows on heat on the one day? So from your experience, what's your advice there? If you can lock calves away for the couple of hours that they're in heat, um, it's a good help just to make sure calves don't get injured. Also, if you've got a yard to let them out into where they've got maybe stones or something uh, grippy so that they're not slipping on slats when they're mounting. And tell me then about um, AI. Why do you use AI? As a suckler farmer, what's the advantage to you of using AI? Well, we have a fragmented farm, so uh, it's not justifiable to buy a, a top class expensive bull for an out farm that might have 20 or 30 cows. So I find the AI, you've got a top quality bull and you don't have the expense of buying or maintaining a bull. So from the point of view of uh, security of calving, quality of calf, choice of bulls, just tell me a bit about that, about your experience with that from, from the point of view of using AI. <clears throat> well, like most suckler farms, we have a variety of cows. We've got Angus, Mental, uh, limousine and when we have the AI bulls we can match what bulls we want for each cow uh, so from even the calving point of view that's uh, very important for some cows that will uh, take a, a harder calving bull and still spit out the calf with no problems and then there's other more muscly cows and they just can't handle that bull so we go with an easier calving bull uh, with higher reliability so we don't have any surprises we haven't had a cesarean in a, probably five or six years. Uh, that's the way we want to keep it. Just to finish up, just to, to go to your the other aspect of your life then as an AI technician. Um, so you're, you're on the road every day, you're calling into farmers every day. So what are your advice to suckler farmers to help you maximise conception rates in their herds? Keep it simple. Um, have your cows in good condition uh, and have some method of heat detection. A teaser bulls, it sounds expensive to get one cut, but it's it's not that expensive. And when you're using them, if you've got a good chin ball on them with full uh, and it full of paint, it's just a matter of checking your stock once a day. There's no heat detection. All you have to do is see your cow that's coloured and ring your AI man as soon as you can, just so you can plan your call. Um, after that, uh, get the cow in in a timely manner. Uh, she could be waiting for a couple of hours, so if you can, 
have water and silage and also a couple of companions just to keep her nice and calm. Make sure your crush is working well, have a good head gate, greased properly and uh, no obstacles in the way, uh, nothing that can frighten the cows and it, that you should get a good result. And I presume stuff like uh, cleanliness and a non-slip crush? Yeah, uh, keep it clean, don't have any uh, silage uh, plastic hanging around that you might trip up over or just the basics, keep, keep the, crush, the crush clean, uh, non-slip non floor. Uh, no bars damaged that might uh, be sharp or impede your job. Um, if cows are a bit frisky or not used to being handled, uh, make sure the crush, the crush gate is, uh, is sufficient to catch the cow's head and restrain her properly. Okay, super, great. Thanks, Robert. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to be joined by Hubert. Uh, Hubert, could you give us a bit of an introduction to yourself and your, your farming system here? Hi, uh, this is, I'm Hubert Nicholson. Um, we're farming uh, 80 suckler cows here. Um, we're taking all the progeny to finish, to beef, and uh, we're in the middle of calving at the moment, and um, we're hoping it's all going to finish up well. Yeah, you have some fantastic cows and, and calves on the ground. How's calving going for you at this time? Yeah, no, at the moment we're, uh, we're very happy things. We've got four sets of twins on the ground, so uh, the numbers are looking good. Brilliant. And um, everything is coming out well, and they're lively and healthy. Great which job. Is a great bonus. We're currently under shelter because there's a bit, of, a bit of rain falling today. I think we're all saying our prayers that uh, we get a bit of sunshine. But uh, you're looking forward to getting them turned out? Yeah, absolutely. I, ha I do have uh, about 25 out at the moment in various bits and pieces in very small numbers. Um, but yeah, with the sheds are starting to get a bit full now, and we'd like to get the rest out maybe in the next 10 days. Um, as soon as they carve, more or less. Great job. I see some fantastic stock over in the fire shed. You, you bring them to, uh, you do bull beef, steer beef? The and we finish about 50 males. Um, we, uh, we buy in a couple to fill up the quota. Uh, so we do um, half of them as bulls and half of them as bullocks. So uh, the bulls go in October at 20 months. And then the, the bullocks go um, probably in the next month or so as uh, going around about 27 months or 28 months. Great job, and uh, I know the quality of stock, you use plenty of AI, so we'll come back to that maybe in, in a second. But over to John, progressive genetics, but also a, a staunch Calvin man with a, a few Charolais up in Calvin. Oh yes, yeah, Breed beef breeding a brave visor with uh, progressive genetics. Uh, Sokla farm, or farm with 40 cows, predominantly Charlie and limousine. Um, I suppose I was a Charlie man through and through, but uh, uh, my daughter influenced me slightly to change a bit of colour, but uh, still a blue jersey. Great job. And, and what's, what system do you run? You bring them through to beef or are you selling the stores? Or? Uh, probably sucklers to stores. Uh, more, um, we run 40 cows, um, uh, selling weanlands. I tend to probably sell a bit more towards the springtime. Um, I suppose coming from years ago, it was predominantly shippers. We, go, we, were, we were selling through export and uh, calves were going off farm usually to the shippers. And that allowed me maybe to feed on into a slightly heavier, heavier weanland selling maybe kind of January time, usually February. Yeah. So you, are, you cav are you calving at the minute then? Or are you calving more? Uh, no, we're calving yeah. well on now at the minute. Okay. We're probably 80% calved. Yeah. Uh, I think there's 10 cows left to calve. Touch wood, uh, all gone well. Um, 28 calves on the ground, 28 cows calved. We had one cow aborted our race that threw a calf probably halfway through. Again, touch wood, so far that's the thing. And look, for me, big priority cabin ease facility are two main factors when I'm picking bulls. Uh, working mostly on my own, well, myself and my daughter, and they have to be quiet, easy to handle. Jack's hanging on the wall, it hasn't come down yet this year. Brilliant, brilliant. And, and hopefully it stays that way for the rest of the cabin well, season. And I hate crossed. talking about these things yeah, because it can change fairly yeah. quick. Yeah, yeah, fingers crossed. But look, as you said, uh, the part-time nature of beef farming is, is very important and we'll touch on the, the aspects of that and labour saving and technology going forward. But I might get an introduction from you, Kieran. Uh, well known in the social media aspect, uh, grace the field for, for me, Jay, as well, but you also do a bit, of, a bit of farming as well. Yeah, John, so um, I'm farming about 20 miles away from Aaron's screen. Uh, so it's a 50 cow, 100% AI, spring cabin, suckler herd very tight, we do Everton calved in about seven, eight weeks, fingers crossed. Everton through to the beef then. Bulls on the grid at 15 months, aiming for about warts and all, I suppose, high 380, 390 kilo carcass. 
and uh, heifers before a second winter. Some years we'll go off grass if the price is good, or the years we'll bring them in, fatten them up. Um, predominantly continental genetics, Angus on heifers, like John, part time. So our farm decisions are about convenience as much as they are about you know profitability and pushing the thing. But we have a good mix at the moment. Great job! It's it's great to see some variety, but a lot of top uh, top producers here, which is, which is great, and we're going to get a lot of information. Rose might get you to give us a bit of introduction. I'm sure most people watching will, will know of you, but uh, a little brief introduction would be great. Yeah, I run the beef breeding program for NCBC, the National Cattle Breeding Centre, and um, that's the breeding program for both Munster bovine and Progressive Genetics. Very good, very good. I think uh, a common theme there was about keeping it simple and keeping it easy, the part-time nature of, of suckler beef uh, breeding and, and indeed finishing and farming. I might go to you, Kieran, from a, an ag tech perspective. Ag technology is very prominent in the dairy industry and the dairy farming. It's, it's reaching the, the suckler farm a, a, yeah. a lot more, to, safe to say, and I know Hubert has a camera up above us here, so we, we might come to Hubert for his comments after, but at home, what are you doing from a technology perspective for labour saving? Yeah, definitely. So we are calving best part of 55 cows in eight weeks, all of us working off farm. Um, so we made two big investments in last in recent years in technology. The first one was the calving camera. Um, I wouldn't be without it now. It enables us to, you know, it, it's, it's fairly straightforward and obvious what it does for us before. It was up during the night checking them two and three times. Now you have full control over the calving process. I will say we've gone away from the harder calving bulls, but our weaning weights haven't suffered and our carcass weights haven't suffered. We're also 100% AI, and when I say that, a lot of people kind of shirk, how do you do it in eight weeks? We do a bit of synchronizing, but only about eight, seven or eight cows a year. Uh, we use the moo call heat detection. We have two collars. So we actually do no manual heat detection now. Um, we let the collars do everything. The first year I got it, I was a bit skeptical. We were kind of standing in the corner of the field watching to see what cows actually bullying. And after about two weeks, I just let the collars away, and that's three years ago. And as well as reducing labor, I think time is your biggest asset as a, as a suckler farmer, particularly part time. It actually has increased our conception rates as well. We've actually increased from kind of low to mid 80s up such a 95% conception, which is tricky in 100% AI, we've no stock bull. So there's no clean up bull in to uh, pick up where we've kind of missed the, missed the boat. So two of the best um, investments we've made have been in technology. Yeah, it's brilliant to see and uh, the importance of it from a, a time perspective. You know, t time is money, as they say. Yeah. Um, when you look back, people often say they wanted more time. So it's great to see that, 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 you, that you're getting that benefit. I might bring in Rose and John just on technology. What we're talking about here is we've talked about technology from electrics perspective. But a key technology that's important on farm is breeding and genetics and getting your artificial insemination correct. So from a suckler perspective, Rose, and you know what you're all doing in NCBC, getting the right bulls into Progressive and, and Munster, what is the focus from a breeding perspective uh, in terms of bulls with NCBC? I suppose the focus is to first of all um, select bulls that um, have the bulls have a specific purpose in mind even from the point of selection um, and if you take suckler farmers what do, what do they want from these bulls so um, some farmers want to breed their own replacements for example so we have a special you know maternal program specifically to breed bulls and to select bulls for, for replacements um, then the wheeling producer he, he's, he's really interested just in the terminal side, so he wants very good weight gain and he wants early shape. And then the finisher and the, and the guy selling stores, he also wants excellent weight gain. He also wants excellent shape, which is ultimately carcass confirmation, but it can come a little bit later for him. So it's really about selecting bulls for the specific purposes. And then um, transcending all of that is really the calving. Um, because difficult calving costs a lot of money for everybody. So trying to achieve everything a suckler farmer wants to achieve um, and minimising the level of calving difficulty. Fantastic. And you, you mentioned a, an American uh, term that's used for a particular type, of, and I'm going to let you touch on it, but I think maybe Kieran might have highlighted it. That's why he's getting less... There's no issue with calving difficulty. He's put more of a focus on calving ease, but he's still hitting that kind of... Yeah, Kieran hit the way. nail on the head. Yeah. Um, the term mm. the Americans use is a curve bender, um, but that's exactly what Kieran described his experience of using AI. Um, no trouble calving, um, still achieving his weaning weights, and, and still achieving his yearling weights. 
Yeah, excellent. I, I, we come back to you, John, maybe on the, the use of AI, um, the importance of it we've touched on. Uh, we've mentioned technology, but from your perspective, you're, you're part-time, you're, mm -hmm. you're working, you do have a, an exceptional advisor at home, but how are you managing the, the, the use of AI on your farm? Well, to be honest, uh, I suppose we've touched a bit earlier on on synchronization, but that's key for me on my farm because like, th the nature of, of our business with, with the genetics and with spring, we get very busy in the springtime. So wh where my AI comes in is on, a, on the early calve and like, I like to kind of get calved into January, into February, uh, as we come into the middle of January and get calved fairly fast. I try to get uh, the end of April, by the beginning of April, the middle of April, that I have a lot of cows back in calf as they're going out at the start before we get busy with AI and, and the breeding season takes over for us. Um, I'm using synchronization. I'm going in with generally 10 to 15 cows in a pack doing two to three runs of synchronization over a couple of weeks. AI and everything across the board and then they're gone and get, it, it's allowing me to run a very tight, re, very tight calving, uh, um, calving pattern in the spring and getting my cows calved quick. Uh, I like to, by the time, I like by the time we're going to grass that I need to be finished. I need to be finished calving by early April, mid-April, because after that, my priorities have moved somewhere else. And it has to stay simple. Calving is a big, big priority with me. Um, uh, docility is another very big priority, because most of the time I'm on my own. I need stock that I can handle. I need stock that I can handle at night. I need stock that I can get in easy and that I can herd easy. Um, they would be the two things, but synchronization is key for me to get the level of AI into the herd that I'm, that I'm able to do. Brilliant. I, I think it's a, it's a common common feature when you're talking to exceptional producers and, and breeders alike and farmers. Rose, just touching on that kind of that climate element of it. So we hear that the, the beef cow is very inefficient and uh, we have too many beef cows or too many cows in Ireland, but we hear in recent weeks that kind of focus around food has changed and the conversation has changed. We produce beef exceptionally well in this country. Um, what can we do going forward? I know we discussed a little bit about kind of the efficiencies and previously we might have spoken on profitability and it was all profit, but now there's that climate and carbon element. What can we do from a, a breeding and management perspective at age of first calving and so on, or finishing age? What, what, what's, what do you think? What are your thoughts? Sure, well I suppose the first thing is we all eat and we all like to eat. So um, food production is important. And I think Ireland is one of the best countries in the world um, where we can produce food sustainably be it beef or milk. Um, so then from a, from a beef point of view, um, we're really, really lucky actually, because everything we can do um, from a breeding point of view that will improve sustainability will also improve profitability. And we're very lucky in that one. We're not being asked to do something, you know what I mean, it's going to cost us more money. Um, so here, you know, if we just think about genetics, what can we do from a genetic point of view to improve sustainability and therefore profitability on a suckler farm. And it's all about efficiency, okay? And it's all about having that animal working for every day it's there. So we want to really reduce the ones that are, you know, waste around the place. So if you, you know, you mentioned it there. So if you talk about fertility, calving a two is a big one. Getting a calf every 365 days um, is another big one. Um, making sure that cow, um, can, can feed her own, calf on her own, um, feed her own calf, and go back in calf, because we want another calf in another 365 days, and stay in the farm then for as many lactations as possible. So all those things around fertility, that's, a, that's an efficient animal, therefore a sustainable animal, therefore more profitable. So that's kind of on the maternal side. If we look then on the terminal side, we need animals that can um, grow very quickly, um, really utilise grass. Um, again, in Ireland, we're really lucky with our climate. We're really lucky with our land type. Um, we're one of the best countries in the world to grow grass. Um, so we need animals to be able to, to utilise grass, um, put on as much weight as possible, and do it as quickly as possible. Um, and the big thing for sustainability is to um, reduce the age at slaughter. Um, so there's a lot of things we can do from a genetic point of view to improve all of those things. Um, the other thing we're looking at from a genetic point of view is feed efficiency. And unfortunately, something we can't measure on farms um, because we just don't have the technology. But we're lucky in Ireland to have um, ICBF and to have Tully. And we have a facility in Tully uh, to, me to measure the feed efficiency of the progeny of our AI bulls. 
Um, so if we have information on the AI bulls, they're the bulls that are producing the greatest amount of progeny out there. And they're also the bulls that, the, that would be the sire of the stock bulls. Um, you know, the pedigree breeders sell to commercial farmers. Um, so even though we're not getting a lot of data on feed efficiency, we're getting it on the important animals that feed down along the, the food chain. Um, and feed efficiency is a big one because we, we need animals that can put on as much weight as possible um, by eating as, li as little as possible. And we found big variation by, you know, in different bloodlines. Um, and then the other thing we're doing here in Ireland, um, and again it's happening in Tully, is actually measuring the amount of methane an animal is producing. And uh, we are starting to see differences between different genetics. Um, so um, two animals doing exactly the same thing from a weight gain point of view and a feed efficient point of view, but one is producing much more methane than the other. Wow. Right. I think it's fantastic from, a, from an industry perspective and a, a farmer on the ground to hear that that's the focus from, a, from a, you know, a breeding perspective and get the right genetics on farm. Because I think we'll all say from a beef industry, there's a lot more we can do from an efficiency perspective to uh, improve our carbon footprint. But farmers are very resilient and open, open to doing that. And I think uh, increasing the use of AI on farm with those uh, breeding targets and genetics, I think, is a, a sure way of, of doing that. Feed and efficiency will be yeah. the next. Like feed efficiency going forward, like from my own point of view, I'm trying to feed it. It's costing me probably, I think it was in the journal last week, over 1,200 to keep a suckler cow. Most of that's feed. So I need a suckler cow that I can put in when she's weaned and just really restrict her without losing condition. And then also finishing bulls. How many price increases has there been in the last six months on, on ration? You know, mm. So feed efficiency is key for us. I think it's great that AI companies are looking at it, but farmers need to consider it more. Um, like if you look at the, the strides that were made in feed efficiency in the, in the last century on monogastric, where they are at now, what they've done with breeding mm -hmm. you know, to mm -hmm. get feed efficiency. And we need to start thinking like that too. If you go to North America, countries, feedlock countries, I know we're not one of those, we don't want to be one of those, but it's no harm to start thinking like that. Because feed is 70, 75% of your variable cost is to feed the animal. Yeah. And in a ruminant, a lot of that is maintenance. So you're mm -hmm. not even getting any gain from it. So that needs to be um, that needs to come to the forefront of our minds and as Rose said, anything that makes us money in general is better for the climate too. Yes. So it's a win-win. Yeah, win and win. I, I think the, the current uh, crisis we're seeing across Europe and you know, the food supply and shortage uh, predicted, um, it'll change our focus as well. I think a simple one you talk about feed is, is silage quality. Yeah. Um, you know, we're going to come into a busy period of making silage and the cost of meal and concentrates. But I know Hubert with finishing uh, exceptional animals and yourself would be uh, certainly uh, focused on improving your, your silage quality. John, from a, a climate perspective, I have to kind of go around the table and ask that question because it is so topical. Um, it is important to the beef herd, it's important to the country, it's important to everyone. But from a beef farmer's perspective, what, what, does that put, what frame of mind does that put you in and what do you think you can do to improve well, their Well, again, it's everything that Rose spoke about there is, is about uh, feed efficiency, it's about uh, days to slaughter. Uh, I suppose the, the one thing that's really uh, made it stand out for me from a, uh, an environmental or sustainability point of view has been through the beef scheme and the calf way, mm. where I have found, like, you're sitting there looking at your way sheet after you've done your recording, like, and you've got a 700 kilo cow, 200 day wean and weight, 270, 280, 300 kilos, and then you've got a 550 kilo cow that's standing beside her with a 200 day wean and weight of 350 kilos. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Like she's 30% lighter and she's producing the same calf. I'm assuming 30% less feed, 30% less methane, 30% saving all around. Like, you know what? I think they were weak and make the efficiencies. Um, Locus coming from a Charlie background, it's hard not to have big cows, do you know yeah, what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. hard not to like big cows sometimes yeah. too, but it's only when you see it down on paper, <coughs> you know, when you've got these the, the, these practical functional function and this would be a lot as I suppose Rose would have influenced a lot of dare I say to change of breeding selection on our farm through sires that she has selected. Uh, but Definitely on the beep sheet on, on, on your, your weaning report there, it's, it's, it's stand out. But any farmer that can look down and it's there to be seen. Like. Yeah, I think that, that point there you mentioned about seeing it on the paper mm -hmm. makes you make that decision. And I know there had been some 
uh, confusion or different opinions on some of the schemes that have been ran, but certainly we have to, you know, credit where credit is due. Some of the schemes that have been ran have encouraged people for best management, best practice, weighing your animals, vaccinating and so on and so forth. And I, I'd agree with you. It's hard to make a decision uh, unless you've measured it. And when you've measured it, you can then manage it, uh, you know. Yeah, well, I know and probably a lot of farmers probably look at these schemes, including myself, it's, it's just another job sometimes. But, like, uh, I find, look, BDGP definitely for me has, has made a difference that um, I'm a bit like here and I, I can roll around and look at the cameras and say in bed at night now, Cav, <laughs> and whereas before this it had to be on the end of a yoke clicking on every one of them, you know. Yeah. Uh, we've, eliminated, we've eliminated caesareans on the farm, touch wood, for having had one in several years now from having several every year. You'll have one tonight uh, now. <laughs> yeah, touch wood, touch wood. <laughs> so that's the touch wood bit. But, uh, um, Look at it, to me it's just keep it simple, I'm working off farm, I want, as Kieran Todd has spoken on the vaccines, scour plans, simple things that make it easy for me to work and keep it off, which is a bit of technology, a bit of uh, technology vaccination, genetics, cavities, and it frees me up to go and do other things. Yeah, no, it's brilliant. So as we're coming up to the, to the breeding season, Hubert, uh, and I'm going to go to the other guys to, to ask them, what, what's at the forefront of your mind ahead of the upcoming breeding season from a, a bull selection perspective? And what bulls have you got in mind? Um, so my, for the bulls that I'll be using on my heifers, um, I'll probably be, well, the, the, the main focus for me would be, I'd like to have a heifer at the end of the day that I'd be able to keep in the herd. So I'll be looking for milk, um, a reasonable frame, a reasonable size frame of a cow. So, um, Simmentals or um, Charolais. Um, so, the Simmentals I'll be using, probably be thinking about using, will be Erp, uh, Frosty King, uh, Gucci for easy calving. And then, possibly, if I had a, a slightly smaller heifer that I was a slightly worried about, I might go with Nell, the Limousin Nell. And then, on the, uh, the cows, um, I could be going a slightly off centre and I'll be looking at some of the French straws. Excellent, yeah, I must take note of them because uh, I wouldn't mind a herd of cows that look like yours, so uh, that's good breeding there. John, what, what about you? What's well, the sure, again, for me, the, the focus for me is going to be on, on Cavanese. It's, it's, it's the main priority, Cavanese and Massility. Uh, for the heifer, for me, it's, it's Nell and Grenache across the board. Uh, the reliability, like the rock solid, I have never any problems. Uh, every heifer on farm this year has calved on her own. Um, going through the cows, uh, I'd be using a bit of nob. Um, uh, Charlie Wise, Lapon, look, he's, he's a little superstar in my opinion. Um, a big fist and fan in the past. Uh, currently, um, Lapon, Orby, Orby is a bull I like a lot. I think he's easy calv and he's doing a really good job. I think he's, he's, he's going to go that way. What I'm looking forward to. Um, uh, Ricky, a new fist and son. Uh, look, we're having no right. calves of him. He's a bull I'll be using now in the spring. Um, uh, Omega, I'm probably going to try a wee bit. I like his, I like his maternal background because I still like to keep a few pedigree Charlies and, and Charlie females around the farm. Um, uh, I like his maternal background that's in, um, in, in Omega. He's Epernay out of a VMO rose, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Big fan of VMO. have yeah. VMO heifers, I think, to probably the good females I have, I think, the temperament yeah. and uh, they're just super cows. Brilliant, there's super cows. A, lot of, a lot of white cattle there, the advisor at home will, will, will well want to see, see more it's reds. It's, 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 it's got to be a bit of a, a traumatic situation <laughs> around our farm, it's like playing for two different teams, you know. <laughs> very good, very good, the best of luck with it, Kieran. I know there's uh, years and years of genetics uh, and AI breeding in your herd, so what's the focus for the upcoming breeding season and bulls to use? So like John, I'd be first and foremost calving difficulty, matching it to the cow obviously, but around about eight, nine percent tops for cows and then heifers as low as possible. Um, reliability with that is important as Rose said. Slight bit different then, so we chase hybrid vigor big time. Um, so as you said, my, my dad has been AI in since I was a tot, so all of our cows nearly are born on the farm from AI sires. So we full parentage on them. So we'll then go in with a sire that isn't in her mix from okay. a breed point of view. Um, and it's, wor it's worked well for us. And my breeding decisions are going to be always with a cow in mind to get it to get a cow, you know, for a daughter. Um, and so far in Calvin, we've had something like eighty percent bulls. Doesn't always happen, but like the bulls that Progressive have, to be fair, yeah. have, we'd always be looking at carcass weight as well. We're not going extreme. 
So like if I have a good smantle limousine cross cow, she'd get a Solaire, you know. Um, in terms of bulls, exactly the same smantles as you, Hubert, the three smantles you mentioned. Uh, Charley, Le Pon, you haven't got any fists and straws lying around for me, have you? <laughs> Oh in no, the back of the freezer somewhere. A lad like me always is yeah, a bit of stuff hidden. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fiston and Le Pon were our two last year, and look, doing the business, definitely. Um, limousine Nell. Mm -hmm. um, use a bit of short horn to try and get that Roni Heffer to sell to an accountant with a big wallet for 4,000, but unfortunately <laughs> got bulls. Um, but I like the calves. Yeah. Really good calves. I, I think it was Firefox was mm. the short horn. Uh, Angus then on Heifers. We used three Angus last year, Fergal. Uh, is it Maverick Rose and mm -hmm. then RGZ, yeah, bouncing up, sucking, great job. So, as I said, it'd be hybrid vigor, Cavanese, and then like all the bulls I mentioned there have good carcass weight figures. So if you get a bull, you're not too bad. You know, you're still going to do the business in the finishing shed. Brilliant. And as Rose mentioned, uh, planning is very important, and those three guys certainly have uh, have their plans in place and yeah. ready for a, a, a successful breeding season. And we wish them all the best of luck. But uh, Rose, if you want to just kind of pull that together, the importance of planning and AI and bull selection and calves on the ground, how, much, how important is that for the industry? Uh, it's really important because um, if you plan, you'll get the outcome right. Um, and that's the secret. So I suppose if you take suckler farmers that are planning to use AI for the season, I think the big thing is, um, to the first thing I'll say, I suppose, don't compromise in calving, especially with maiden heifers. Um, so, and if you're calving a two, you need, need to use exceptionally easy calving, like Kieran is doing there with his, with his Angus bulls. We just don't compromise it on maiden heifers. You can use more difficult calving bulls then, as the, you know what I mean, as, as the parity goes up. And get to know your cows, know your cattle. Um, that, that's really secret. Um, and I suppose at the end of the day, think about the overall output from the farm, as opposed to uh, going for broke um, with, with one super calf. Um, so think about the overall outcome. So if you're a wheeling producer um, and you can calve those heifers a little bit earlier, if you, if you can get more cows in calf, more live calves on the ground, if that means an extra wheeling you're going to the mart with, it's very hard to make up that with, with, um, with super individuals. So think about more calves and an extra wheeling to go to the mart. And then if you're finishing, think about the extra beef then you'll have to sell to the factory. So look at the overall output of the farm, um, I'd say would be my one, you know, um, summing up point as opposed to looking for super individuals, because super individuals can cost us money sometimes. Brilliant. <coughs> what a fantastic way to finish, Rose. Um, I'd like to thank everyone for their time today. I wish them best of luck for the rest of the calving season and, of course, best of luck for the upcoming breeding season. I'm away to take some notes from Hubert's farm to improve my own home farm and I wish you the best of luck and enjoy the rest of the night.